Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Well, before we do get started... I do want to let you know this program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. And I particularly want to thank our two latest Patreon supporters. Greg became our second Chief of Detectives supporter with a a donation of $30 or more per month. And Debbie at the Detective Sergeant level, which is $7.14 or more per month. You can uh, become a monthly ongoing supporter of the show at patreon.greatdetectives.net. I also uh, want to thank John so much for his support. As he mailed in a donation, our mailing address is at our website at support.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it's time for today's episode of Michael Shane. Original air date, May the 14th of 1945. And the title is Date with a Wedding. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. Even the busiest detectives can't always be detecting. And on this late Saturday afternoon, we find Mike Shane and his pretty assistant, Phyllis Knight, driving through the timber country high up near the Nevada border. They're on their way to keep an important date, a date with a wedding. But no, not theirs. It's the wedding of Betty Harrison, daughter of the timber tycoon, and Mike has been unwillingly dragged along to help Phil carry out her social obligations. You know, I ought to have my head examined coming way out here to see two people I don't know get married. Oh, Mike. Betty was my closest friend at finishing school. Yeah, but I only finished uh, high school. Now, where do I fit into this high society stuff? Michael, it's a quiet wedding. We're the only guests. And I'm supposed to hold the bridegroom's fevered head? Mike, where is your romance? Romance I've got, Angel, but when it comes to rice and orange blossoms, I'm strictly allergic. Mm -hmm. You're hopeless. Hey, look. Look, there's the Harrison place. Place, you say? That, my love, is quite a shack. And there's Betty. There's Betty waiting for us. Yeah, say, honey, that that guy with her looks familiar. Huh? Mike, that's Inspector Faraday. In the flesh, and that spells trouble. Betty? Betty? Phyllis. Phyllis, I'm so glad you've come. Oh, you look wonderful. Me too. Betty, this is Mike Shane. Hello. I'm pleased to meet you. Well, I'll be. Mike and Phyllis. Say, Inspector, aren't you early with your vacation? No, I'm here on business, Mike. Mr. Harrison phoned me. Said he was leaving on the second section of 98. But he transferred to his own private trainer for me to meet him here. Father wasn't planning to come up for the wedding. Then all of a sudden, I get a wire that he is. Well, that must be Harrison's train now. Yes, it runs up to a little station behind the house. Well, then why don't we walk over and meet it, huh? Let's. Father will be surprised. Betty. Hey, where's the bridegroom? Don should have been here by now. Oh, bridegrooms are always late. Those last three hours. You be quiet. Betty. Oh, there's Don coming now. Hey, he's a bit of all right. I'm hmm? sorry I'm late. Had a flat tire. Oh, Don, dearest. This is Phyllis Knight. Hello. Mr. Shane. Mr. Faraday. Don Manchester, my fiance. How do you do? Hello there. How are you? Well, there she is, a coming around the mountain. You know, this is something yeah, to see, an engine right? pulling one coach. <laughs> they dropped the lumber cars off at Camp Junction. Oh. Hey, look. Hey, look. There, there's somebody getting off. Oh, that's Mr. Oliver, father's business associate. Oh, that's Mr. Miller getting off the back platform. I still don't see Mr. Harrison. No. Oh, Mr. Oliver. Oh, hello, Betty. Where's father? Oh, as usual, in his private compartment. Hasn't even stepped out since we left Northwood City. He's probably napping again. Mm, he certainly was fine company. Well, I'm going up to the house. Yeah, that's one happy character. Let's climb aboard and get farther. Sort of like a welcoming committee, mm-hmm. huh? Okay. Uh, Inspector, watch yeah. your lumbago on these steps. Never mind my lumbago, Mike. <laughs> watch out for those fallen arches of yours. <laughs> oh, get him. Oh, man. <laughs> Here's Father's compartment. I'll sneak in and shout boo. Father! Something's wrong. What is it? What is it? Father! It's Harrison stretched out on the floor. Oh, Betty's fainting. Here, put her on that couch, Don. Wait a minute. Rub her wrist. Wait a minute. I'll get some water. 
Well, Inspector, how's Mr. Harrison? He's dead, Mike. Looks like a heart attack. Uh Uh-huh. Maybe so, Inspector, but this heart attack has had a little help. What are you talking about? About murder, Inspector. Froth on the lips and dilated eyes don't spell a heart attack. Somebody slipped Mr. Harrison a nice big slug of poison. Oh, there you are, Mike. Get Betty up to the house all right? Yes, Inspector. Phil and Don are taking care of her. You still think Mr. Harrison was poisoned? I know so, Inspector. Look at his neck, stiff, and his jaws locked, eyes wide open and staring. Mm -hmm. I've got a little plan, Inspector. Would you like to try it? You know me, Mike. Well, look, no one knows we suspect murder, and whoever pulled this job figured on a local doc calling it a heart attack. So? Now, you take Harrison's body into Northwood City along with that thermos of coffee we found by him. Mm -hmm. While you're checking for poison, Uncle Shane here will keep his big ears open here. All right, honey, how's Betty? Oh, she's a little better, Mike. She's sleeping now. Oh, the poor kid. Say, uh, what was that Betty said about her father not coming up for her wedding? Well, originally, he didn't like the idea of her marrying. But she was going to go through with it anyway? Yes. Then Mr. Harrison changed his mind, that's all. Uh, Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Mike, when you start double-talking, I get worried. Angel, look, there were three men on that private train making a 50-mile trip. Now, come to the end of the line, what happens? Well, I'm listening, Mike. Miller gets off the back platform and scoots. Oliver hops off the front and goes away mad. And we go aboard and find Mr. Harrison dead. Uh Uh-huh, that's it. This Mr. Harrison is the big boss, honey. You'd think those other two would wait for him, sociable-like. Oh, it's probably just a coincidence, Mike. Uh, And is it a coincidence that Faraday is here? On business? All right, all right, mastermind. So what do you make of it? Uh Uh-uh, Angel. A good detective works from facts, so let's go get some. Facts? Where? Where, Mike? Mr. Miller's room is at the end of this hallway. Let's stop in and say hello, huh? Oh, I hope you know what you're doing. Yeah, me too. Here's his room. I'll knock. There's no answer, Mike. So, being friendly people, we'll go in and wait. Well, you can't just barge into somebody... Why not? The door's not locked. Come on, come on. Mike, I don't like this. Well, now, don't you worry your pretty head. Well, the remains of a fire in the fireplace. I always love to poke around ashes. Now, let's see. Those look like letters. Mm -hmm. Letters they were. Letters to Betty. Well, she's asleep in her room. While someone conveniently burns her mail. Mike, let's get out of here. What's the matter, Angel? There's just us two. That's where you're wrong. Mike. Huh? Well, well, Mr. Miller... And with a nice shiny gun. We don't like snoopers around here. Get going. Uh, just a mistake, Miller. Just a mistake. That kind of mistake isn't healthy. Get out while you're still lucky. Sure. By coincidence, we were just leaving. Come on, Angel. Right away. The gentleman doesn't like our type. And I'm afraid the feeling is very mutual. <laughs> These couple of scraps I took from Miller's fireplace don't help much, honey. Well, I can't understand why anyone would burn Betty's letters from her father. Mm. Oh, well. Yeah, plenty of books around. Michael, after all, this room is the library. Encyclopedia? Modern timbered methods? Look, honey, here's a book, Famous Scotland Yard Murder Cases. Well, that ought to help you, Mike. And here's a bookmark. In the section on poisons. Mike, here comes Don. Mr. Oliver's with him. Huh? Mr. Shane. Well, what's up, Don? I told Mr. Oliver you're a detective. He wants to talk to you. <laughs> yes, uh, something quite confidential. Miss Knight is my assistant. Oh, never mind. And... Never mind. I'll go look up a sandwich. Okay, dear. All right, Oliver. Now, what's the trouble? Mr. Shane, I want protection. Protection from what? Miller. He threatened my life on the train. Oh, what happened? Well, shortly after Miller came aboard Mr. Harrison's private train at Northwood City, I discovered him going through some of Mr. Harrison's private papers. Then what? We had an argument, and he drew a gun on me. What is Miller's position in the company? Frankly, I don't know. He's on Harrison's personal payroll. Betty's been rather worried. She felt that Mr. Miller had some sort of a hold on her father. Yes, that's it exactly. There was a very suspicious relationship. And uh, you want me to do what? Watch Miller every minute. He's dangerous. Mike? Yes, honey? Mike? Yes? A telephone call for you here in the den. Oh, okay. Inspector oh. Faraday. All right. Okay, Phil, close the door. All right. 
Hello, Faraday. Well, what's the dope? Yeah? Well, that might help. Oh, sure, sure, they're all here. Don't worry, I'll be careful. Okay, Inspector, hurry back. So long. What'd he say, Mike? I was right, honey, 100% right. Harrison was loaded with strychnine. Well, then it, it was murder. And that's not all. I heard the click of an extension phone. There are extensions all over the house, Mike. Someone listened. We're keeping company with the murderer, honey. And the trouble is, we don't know who he is. But he knows we're looking for him. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis in their adventures. Dirty or burned-out spark plugs can cost you a lot of gasoline. In fact, as much as one tank full out of ten. Now, that's a serious loss in mileage, particularly so when it's unnecessary. Your neighborhood Union Oil Minuteman is equipped to give you complete spark plug service. The performance of each plug is accurately measured on a special tester, and you can see the results for yourself. If your plugs are dirty, the Minuteman will clean and re-gap them to the proper setting. If they're burned or worn out, he can furnish you with correct replacements. Then you'll not only save gasoline, but your engine will run smoother. Union Oil Spark Plug service takes but a few minutes and costs but a few cents, a cost you'll soon save in extra mileage. So, friends, if it's been 3,000 miles or more since your spark plugs were checked, or if your engines seem to be rough and listless, drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 and ask for Union Oil Spark Plug Service. It will make driving easier. Gas coupons go farther. It is a few minutes later. Mike and Phil have learned that what started out as a happy wedding has turned into a grim case of murder by poison. We find them walking rapidly towards the station behind the Harrison's house. The murdered man's private coach is still there on its siding, made almost invisible by the tall trees which turn the weak moonlight into gloomy shadows. Come on, honey. Well, I'm hurrying as fast as I can. I want to see if that briefcase is still in the car. Inspector Faraday remembered that Harrison mentioned some important papers he was bringing up with him. Well, then whoever was listening on the extension, they know about it, too. Right, and I want first crack at that briefcase. Hey, maybe you do, Mike, but huh? so does someone else. Yeah, a flashlight. In Harrison's private car. Maybe it's the murderer. Hang on, honey, we'll find out. Mike! Mike, there he is, at the end of the car. Hey, honey, look out! Did he hit you? No, no, a clean miss. Oh, he got away out the front. Could you see who it was? No, a flashlight in my eyes. Well, we'll catch up with him sooner or later. Oh. Let's go look over the compartment. Here it is, the briefcase. Oh, what a break for us. We frightened him away without the case. Uh, uh, sorry, honey, bad guess. The lock on the briefcase has been forced open. Oh, and whoever was here opened it and got what he wanted. Correct. Now, here's some papers. Business letters, checkbook. Some kind of a report. Honey! What's the matter? This report. It's from the Atlas outfit. Atlas? Uh-huh. The, the detective agency in Los Angeles? Sure, sure. Listen to this. On the basis of our completed investigation, you have sufficient grounds to instigate criminal action against Z. Z? Evidently, Harrison didn't want the name mentioned. Well, Mr. Harrison was certainly checking up on somebody. And getting ready for the kill. I'll bet that's why Inspector Faraday's here. Mike, this is the motive for the murder. All we have to do is find out if Miller or Oliver is the Z in that report, and we've got the murderer. Partly right, Angel, partly. But I'd say it was better this way. Find out which one of them is Z, and the other guy is the killer. Huh? I don't get it, Mike. Look, Angel, look. The murderer listened in on my, my telephone conversation with Faraday. Yeah. He heard the inspector tell me about this briefcase, and he knew it held evidence that could hang him. Well, of course. That's why he dashed down here. Right, Angel. He beat us to the briefcase, and yet this report is here for us to find. Oh, oh. You see? Mm -hmm. He wanted us to find this report, and that means the killer isn't Mr. Z. As soon as we get back to the house, I'll send a telegram to the Atlas people. Okay, but these high heels don't go very well with forests. Yeah. Mike. Yeah. Someone on that other path. Freeze behind this tree. All right. 
Whoever it is, he's walking fast. He's going fast. No, he isn't. Hey, you hold it. Hey, what the... Mike. Mike, it's Miller. I say, what's the big idea of roughing me? I just want to ask you a few friendly questions, Tom. Oh, now, look here. First, about a gun that took a couple of shots at us. Oh, you're off the beam. I'm not carrying a gun. No? Well, don't mind me. I'll just search. Oh, go ahead. Well? Well, Mike? No, no gun. But you could have ditched it easy enough. Oh, Miss Knight, Mr. Shane. It's Don. Well, what's the hurry, Don? Oh, I was out for a walk. Is something wrong? Plenty. I'm glad you're here. Well, I don't understand. Yeah, Shane. How about you doing some explaining? Okay. Mr. Harrison was murdered. What? Murdered? But why? Who? That's what we're finding out. Miller, you're on the spot and it's plenty hot. Are you saying I killed Harris? He was poisoned on that coach, and you and Oliver were the only ones aboard. Oh, that doesn't prove a thing. It proves there's a 50-50 chance that you're it. Listen, smart guy. Your mathematics aren't so good. There were three of us on that train. Sure, sure. But only you and Oliver walked off. I don't mean Harrison. Somebody else got on that coach. <laughs> oh, now we have the ever-present uh, mysterious third party. Hmm? Mm, not so mysterious. He's standing right next to you. All right, Don. That means you. Well, as a matter of fact, Mr. Shane, I did get on Mr. Harrison's train at Mill Junction. Well, Shane, guess I can be running along while you turn the heat on him. Uh, not so fast. I still think you know some of the answers. You know, maybe I do. And maybe I might just do a little talking to the right party. And when it will do me the most good. You're sticking your chin out a mile. This is murder. Well, I'll be around resting in my room. No, I don't trust him at all. Yeah? But you're still right in the middle of this, Don. You were on that death train. Oh, but I only stayed a minute. You see, Mr. Harrison was asleep, and I didn't want to disturb him. Which still doesn't explain why you drove out of your way from Northwood City to meet the train at the junction. Oh, it's a very personal matter. Look, Don, look, a man has been murdered. Wait, why should I want to kill my future father-in-law? Harrison wasn't too happy about you marrying his daughter. Oh, but he changed his mind. That's why he sent me a telegram this afternoon, asking me to meet his train. Oh, and what kind of a telegram might that be? Well, I have it right here. Read it for yourself. Here, honey. Huh? I'll hold the flashlight. All right, Mike. Wait a minute. Uh, Don, have changed my mind. Happy to have you as son-in-law. Meet my train at Camp Junction. We'll ride in together. Much to talk over. Harrison. Sounds all right. Let me see it, Angel. Here. Yeah, from Northwood City at 3.20 today. Yeah, I wish I could help in some way. Yeah, sure, but... Hey, what was that? It's a window. Someone lowered it. That's Mr. Oliver's room. Mike, he must have heard everything. Yeah, and something tells me we'll be hearing his little story very soon. <laughs> That's right. The telegram is to the Atlas Detective Agency, Los Angeles. Uh, this is it. Please advise immediately. Name of Z. Yes, Z, the last letter in the alphabet. Name of Z in report to Harrison. Right. Sign that Michael Shane. That's right. Send it right out, please. And phone the reply here to me at Harrison's place. Thank you. Goodbye. Well, the answer to that telegram should mean a lot, Mike. Well, it'll help, darling, but there's some angles I don't get. Miller is a mysterious employee of Harriet Harrison's, all very hush-hush. Oliver's scared stiff of Miller, and Don goes walking around in the moonlight right after somebody takes a shot at us. Oh, you can't blame him for that, Mike. Here the night before his wedding and his future father-in-law is poisoned. Yeah, sure, sure, but there's one thing we do know. There's a killer here. Well... There's a car outside. That must be Inspector Faraday, and in a big hurry. It's too bad you haven't the murderer all signed, sealed, and ready to deliver. Now, Angel, now sarcasm doesn't become you. Well, well Mike, Phil, how goes the home front? Oh, quite a few interesting details for you, Inspector. Whatever you're figuring, Mike, forget it. Ah, uh -uh, huh? that means the Inspector knows something. Plenty. While you two were taking it easy, I cracked this case wide open. Yeah? Well, Gib, who's the murderer? Miller. Miller? Sure. I thought his face had a familiar profile. So I checked on him with headquarters. And found what? He's got a record a mile long. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll be willing to wager it's for blackmail. That's right. But how did you know? Inspector, are you forgetting? Mike is smart. All right. I hope Miller's still around. He said he'd be in his room. Good. Let's go pick him up. Okay. Let's go. Well, Mr. Shane, it looks like Faraday beat us to it this time. Oh, he's just a good man, honey. <laughs> yeah. Tell me, what's the line on Miller? 
All the usual stuff. Hires out as a private investigator and then turns the information he picks up into blackmail. Wow, cute boy. That racket should put him in clover. Yeah, but this time, Mike, it'll put him right in the middle of the lethal chamber at San Quentin. Ooh. Here's Miller's room. Yeah, no need to knock, Mike. Just open it up. Okay, here goes. Miller, we want you... Say, what? Well, there's your man, Inspector. You can take him in, but unfortunately, he's very dead. <laughs> We'll return to Mike Shane and his adventures in just a moment. It's true that clean spark plugs make a difference in engine performance and gasoline mileage. But it's also true that even the finest spark plugs cannot fire properly if the ignition cables are defective. These cables are the small, fine wires which carry the electricity from the distributor to the spark plugs. They should be carefully inspected whenever your spark plugs are checked because old or damaged ignition cables leak electricity, which means that only a thin, weak spark reaches the plugs. So to get new performance out of old engines, ask the Union Oil Minuteman to check both spark plugs and ignition cables. Then you'll be sure of more power and better mileage. Just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 and ask for Union Oil Ignition Service. Thank you. Phyllis, Mike, and Inspector Faraday have just burst into Miller's room, only to find him dead, shot through the heart. This new development has put quite a crimp in the inspector's plans, and Mike is pointing this fact out to him. Looks like you were wrong about Miller, Inspector. At least wrong about his being the murderer. Miller could still have been the one who bumped off Harrison, then somebody took care of him. Well, that would leave us with two killers. Well, could be, but it doesn't stack up that way. Well, as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to take Oliver in and charge him with murder. Okay, so you're charging him with murder. But how are you going to make it a stick, Inspector? How about motive? What, what evidence do you have? Oh, two and two make four, Mike. Harrison must have been poisoned on that private train. So it had to be Oliver. There's Miller lying there, absolutely eliminated. All fine and good, but it leads us to one other little item. Don was on that train, too. Don? Betty's fiancé? Mike, you saw the telegram Mr. Harrison sent him. Don couldn't have been the murderer. In this business, honey, we've got to figure every suspect guilty until we know they're innocent. Yeah, Mike's right. Oh, Phil, would you step into the other room and phone the coroner down at Northwood City? Yeah, yeah, sure, Inspector. I'll give him your compliment. You know, this business is beginning to make sense. The one who poisoned Harrison had to get rid of Miller because he knew too much. Miller said he might do some talking when the right time came. Well, Mike, for my money, Oliver fits into the picture. He's our man, and I'll get some evidence out of him. Oh, I'm sure he knows Inspector. plenty, but... Yeah. Inspector, I tried to call the coroner, but the telephones are dead. Uh-oh, the wires have been cut. Well, that don't make much difference. Oh, yes, it will, Inspector. You see, I'm expecting a reply to a telegram I just sent, a very important telegram. About this case? Yes, sir, in connection with the detective agency's report to Mr. Harrison. The answer to that why might be just what we need. Oh, now that the phones are dead, what are we going to do? Do? Simple, darling. The inspector will sit tight here while you and I go for a nice moonlight ride back to Northwood City. There it is. There's the telegraph office just on the other side of the tracks. Okay, I'll park the bus here. Now, watch it. Easy crossing these tracks, honey. Oh, thanks for the tip, old boy. But you could have carried me. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> More trains. Yeah, this is the main line from San Francisco. So isn't this the place where Harrison transferred to his private train? Correct. Well, here's the telegraph office. folks. Can I help you? Uh, yes, I'm Mike Shane. I'm expecting a wire from Los Angeles. Mm, Shane. Let me see... Yeah, your telegram's coming in now. I'll have it for you in just a minute. Okay. Look, Mike. Hmm? There's another. The train just pulled in. Now, oh. that's 8.20, miss. Only stops for a few minutes. 8.20? Well, it's late. It's 8.35 now. Nope. Train's on time. That there's the second section of the 8.20. Oh. So many people traveling, huh? Yep. Too many. That's why they run two sections. Like this afternoon, the second section of 98 came in at 3.40 with a whole parcel of folks. Is that right? You know, honey, that's interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah, of course it is. What are you staring at me that way for? Well, here's a telegram, mister. Oh, swell, swell. Oh, come 
Come, come on. Who was Mr. Z in that report? Well, this does it, honey. This does it. That Z is nobody else but Oliver. Oliver? Then Faraday's right. No, Angel. Faraday isn't right. Oliver wasn't Harrison's murderer. But uh, come on back to Harrison's place for a little meeting of the minds with Inspector Faraday. <laughs> All right, is uh, everybody coming? Yeah, they're coming, Mike. I told Betty and Don, Oliver. Good girl, good girl. Now, uh, now to open these French windows. There. Okay, Faraday, now out on the porch with you. Right, Mike. Phil, drape that beautiful body in that chair. Oh, thank you. Yes, my Lord Master. Well, here comes Betty and Don. Oh, hello. I'm sorry it was necessary to bother you. Don and I understand. I'm glad to help in any way, Mr. Shane. Thanks, Don. Come over here. Stand by me out of range. <laughs> Certainly, but... How to range? I don't understand. Now, what is all this rigmarole about in the middle of the night? There's nothing to get excited about, Oliver. I asked Miss Knight to call you downstairs for a conference. A conference? About what? About mysterious happenings around here, but particularly about why Harrison had you investigated by a detective agency. Hmm? Mr. Shane, what do you mean? I mean you've been cheating the Harrison Timber Company out of thousands of dollars. Oh, that's Why, ridiculous. Why, Mr. Harrison trusted me implicitly. He did, until he finally caught up with you. That's why he was going to turn you over to Inspector Faraday today. I won't listen to this. There's no proof. There's plenty of proof, all written down in black and white. What's more, you knew Harrison had you dead to rights. That's why you poisoned him. You're mad. I never killed anyone. It's no use, Oliver. You're hooked like a fish. No, I didn't murder him. You can't frame me. He's running. He's running towards that window. Oh, I'll stop him. No, Don, no. Drop that gun. That's better. You knocked the gun out of my hand. You let Oliver get away. Oh, no, no. Here comes the inspector. And he's got our friend Oliver by the well-known collar. No, there no. is, Mike, squirming, but no. safe and sound. I didn't do it. I'm innocent. Take him in, Faraday. You've got enough on him to make it stick and stick hard. Yes, he's a dead duck. Oh, Mr. Shane, I can't believe Mr. Oliver would kill my father. But, uh, he didn't, Betty. What? Well, you just told the inspector to take him in. Sure, Don. I'm taking Oliver in for theft. But for Mr. Harris's murder, we'll take you. Me? Oh, what? What are you saying? Sorry, Betty. Don wanted to marry you in the worst way. He married a couple of other girls with wealthy parents. Oh, Betty, don't listen to him. When your father suddenly wired he was coming up, Don knew it was the showdown. That's ridiculous. Oh, no, no, no. You had a hunch Harrison engaged Miller to investigate It's a lie. You saw the telegram Mr. Harrison sent me just this afternoon. Sure, Don, sure you got a telegram. A telegram you sent to yourself. All you did was slip over to the Northwood City, wait until the train pulled in, and then send that telegram to your own address and sign Harrison's name. Oh, nothing but lies. No, lies. no, 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 son. It's a fact, a fact that we can prove. Because you made a mistake, a bad mistake, Don. You saw the train pull into Northwood City and thought that Harrison was on it. But you didn't know that there were two sections of that train today and that Harrison was on the second section. You sent that telegram 20 minutes before Harrison got there. <laughs> You know, it's wonderful to be getting back home, here by the Golden Gate. Oh, I like it. You know, honey, one of these days they're going to put up a statue for me, right on Market Street. Oh, I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it at all. You're such a genius. <laughs> well, maybe not a genius, but quick with the answers, mm. huh? Speaking of answers, is mm? a couple you still owe me? Oh, please, honey, no more now, questions. Now, remember, remember, Mike, that statue to a genius? Okay, okay, shoot me the question. When did you know for sure that Don was the murderer? When we found Miller shot, of course. Why then? Don't you remember, honey, when we caught uh, up with Miller sneaking back to the house from Harrison's private train, he said he would talk to the right person when it would do him the most good? Yeah, yeah, I thought he meant Faraday. Oh, no, no, no. Our blackmailing friend was talking right through us to the only other party there, which meant Don. He was throwing out a hint for a payoff. Well, of course, I know, but how about... That's the... all, honey, please, that's all, positively all. And hold on to your hat, because I'm turning. Just a minute, this isn't the way to the office. You're turning into Golden Gate Park. Ha-ha! <laughs> Is that bad? Tune in again next week at 8.30 for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as Inspector Faraday. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff, 
and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying good night for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. This is Andrea J. Graham, author of the Web Surfer series. Oh, and a man's wife. You're listening to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. Welcome back. Well, a very interesting twist uh, regarding the train, and overall, just another solidly written Michael Shane story. Well, we have gotten some listener comments and feedback regarding Michael Shane. With uh, Dick uh, noticing something about the names, I noticed that Shane apparently also has an Inspector Faraday, like Boston Blackie. Am I missing something? Uh, Dick, I would say no. Um, the, it's not, um, I think, an attempt to rip off or to borrow from Boston Blackie. Um... The relationship between Shane and his Inspector Faraday and uh, Boston Blackie and his Inspector Faraday, uh, particularly at this point in the radio version, the ver uh, Inspector Faraday was constantly trying to track down and to lay uh, a allegations against Boston Blackie in film and the radio, believing that Blackie was guilty of everything. Uh, so entirely different relationship. Uh, it's kind of like there was a Lieutenant Riley in Let George Do It, and Lieutenant Riley had previously been on Nick Carter. And I think that goes back to the old uh, stereotype about Irish policemen. When you start getting into the middle 40s, you see... Uh, uh, a lot of programs moving away from the stereotypical Sharon Bigora sort of uh, blarney talk from uh, policemen. But many writers continue to use Irish last names like Riley or Faraday. Did you see that on the radio? A fair bit in the mid-40s. And so I think that is it. It certainly didn't come from the Michael Shane books, which had another uh, police foil. And, of course, was set in another city. And Brian uh, says, I always picture Nathan Lane when I hear these episodes. Hmm, interesting. I wonder in what role. All right, well, that will do it uh, for today. We will be back tomorrow with The Crime Files of Flamond. And join us back here next Monday for another episode of Michael Shane. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives.